With a spectacular gala in Tiananmen Square, China concludes the celebrations for the 17th anniversary of the People's Republic. Peru's army and the bishops back President Vizcarra after a night of drama inside and outside the Congress. And a Moroccan journalist gets a year in prison for alleged abortion. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo and this is From the South. A day of celebrations has come to an end in China for the 17th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic. The final event was a huge gala in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. President Xi Jinping and other government leaders joined the crowds for the show. A total of 60,000 people took part in the performances, including workers, farmers and professionals. A series of choreographed displays represented China's great achievements over the last 70 years, and fireworks lit up the sky as mass choirs sang dozens of classic Chinese songs. And earlier in the day, hundreds of thousands of people, including representatives from across the country, gathered at Tiananmen Square to watch the parade of troops and military equipment. In his address to the nation, President Xi Jinping hailed the remarkable achievements that the country has scored in the past seven decades. He called for unity to safeguard those achievements and to achieve new victories. Over these 70 years, the Chinese people of different ethnic groups have worked hard with one mind and enterprising spirit to make great achievements that won high esteem around the world. Today, a socialist China is standing proudly in the world's east and no force can change the position of our great motherland and no force can stop the Chinese people and the Chinese nation from stepping forwards. While forging ahead, China must adhere to the principle of peaceful reunification and one country, two systems, maintain lasting prosperity and stability in the Hong Kong and Macau special administrative regions, promote peaceful development of cross-strait ties, and unite the whole Chinese population to continue the fight for full reunification of our motherland. Despite the president's call for unity, Hong Kong's rioters threw patrol bombs and lit fires across the city as violent protests continued. In a bid to safeguard citizens, police carried out disbursement operations with tear gas and other appropriate force as warnings were ignored. Hong Kong police have since condemned the violent acts. They also uploaded images showing injuries to police officers and reporters following the clashes. Still, a colorful flag-raising ceremony was held in Hong Kong's Golden Bawina Square to mark the 17th anniversary of the founding of the PRC. Speaking at the event, the city's chief secretary for administration, Matthew Chung, appealed to all residents to reject violence and attempts to divide them. The Venezuelan Vice President Lelcy Rodriguez has condemned the decision of a U.S. court to press ahead with the seizure of assets belonging to CIPCO, the U.S. subsidiary of Venezuela's state oil company. She said it was part of a criminal plot by the opposition figure Juan Guaido and those acting for him in the United States. Y Venezuela, ¿qué hará? Venezuela will defend itself. That is the instruction that President Nicolás Maduro has given to the Attorney General to continue defending the rights of Venezuela in the United States, which is the only country that has recognized this fake Attorney General appointed by Guaidó. This man is working in collusion with the Trump administration to hand out the booty they are seizing. But President Nicolás Maduro has instructed our Attorney General to defend Venezuela in the U.S. Peace organizations in Colombia have called on President Iván Duque to change his foreign policy and stop his attacks on countries that contributed to the peace process. The organizations are pleading with the president to change his foreign policy to ensure that peace prevails over war. They have also criticized Duke's continued attacks on countries which have contributed to the tranquil climate in Colombia. Colombians respect and appreciate the support and solidarity Venezuela has given to our nation, not just with establishing peace on the political front, but also financial assistance. And we want Duque's government to stop its aggression because this dire foreign policy violates our constitution and international treaties. According to analysts, 
Colombia's relationship with other countries in the region has become destabilized, especially the countries that oppose the United States policies. And Duke's policies are closely linked to those of the USA. In the case of Venezuela, I see the government's clear intent to interfere in the process between the government and the opposition. And in Cuba, Duque's government wants to delegitimize the dialogue process and undermine Cuba in the international arena. All this is happening at a time when the head of Colombia's military intelligence unit was fired. He is said to be responsible for the fake pictures contained in the dossier presented to the United Nations by President Ivan Duke. It showed supposed members of the guerrilla present in Venezuelan territory. Various members of Colombia's Congress have since called for the firing of the defense minister. The political responsibility for the political errors committed by the government must be answered by government ministers and not by officials. Peace organizations and human rights defenders are both requesting an end to the attacks against Cuba and Venezuela and a resumption of the agreement signed in favor of peace and dialogue with the National Liberation Army. The Bahamas intends to deport undocumented migrants living in shelters following the devastation caused by Hurricane Dorian. Migrants are also warned that they will not be allowed to return to the Abaco Island. According to the Nassau Guardian Immigration Minister, Ellsworth Johnson, said that shelters will not be used to circumvent the law. He reminded that there is an Immigration Act which remains in effect and said the Director of Immigration understands that he must enforce it. The Bahamas was back by the devastating Category 5 storm, which flattened islands that house mostly undocumented migrants. African migrants have demonstrated in the Mexican city of Tapachula to demand free transit through the country. Hundreds of protesters marched with banners to the city hall to press their demand. Representatives of the migrants said that almost 3,000 of them are trapped in Tapachula and suffer discrimination from local authorities. The police in Haiti have used tear gas and live ammunition to disperse protesters as tens of thousands took to the streets calling on President Jovenel Moïse to resign. At least four people have died in a clash in recent days. Haitians have been protesting against President Jovenel Moïse for months now as there is a growing shortage of food, fuel and other basic supplies. The country is grappled with inflation, corruption accusations against public officials. The people are fighting and the government is repressing it. The town is on the street to dismiss Jovenel. To expel Jovenel means solution to hunger. To dismiss Jovenel means solution to the murders in the popular neighborhoods, as we see it in La Saline, Tokyo, Grand Ravine and Fort Nacional. Being on the street is a political battle against the system. Coming up, Ecuador to withdraw from the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, on January 1st, 2019. Don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The Peruvian army and police have, have come out in favor of President Martin Vizcarra as a power struggle between the president and Congress came to a head. Thousands packed the streets outside Parliament in the capital, Lima, and in other cities to celebrate the president's move to dissolve Congress and call for early elections. The Congress retaliated by saying it had sacked the president, but the protesters insist that corrupt lawmakers must go. There is too much corruption, too many shameless politicians. It was time for this to happen, for there to be a change. It was time to close it, because the gentlemen in the Congress have done whatever they wanted. Vizcarra has obeyed the people, and that's important because we know that someone represents us, because the Congress never represented us. The protest swelled as President Martin Vizcarra announced he was dissolving Congress. This came after lawmakers had blocked his bill to bring forward elections as part of a series of reforms to combat corruption. The Congress, which is controlled by supporters of Keiko Fujimori, responded by declaring the presidency vacant and throwing in the Vice President Mercedes Arauz as his replacement. 
I am temporarily assuming the presidency of the Republic, at least in response to the fact that President Vizcarra has failed. Our correspondent in Lima, Veronica Isausti, has the latest. The situation is a lot calmer now that it was overnight. The Congress is surrounded by a police cordon, and they are only allowing entry to members of the permanent committee, which has the job, once the Congress has been dissolved, of organizing fresh elections, which have been proposed for the first three months of next year. Last night, the entire high command of the armed forces expressed their support for the president's decision to close Congress. And the conference of Peruvian bishops also welcomed what they called the struggle against corruption. Some members of Congress were already trying to leave the country early this morning. We should remember that the chief prosecutor investigating the Lava Jato case is today questioning a key witness in Brazil. And out of that, we expect to emerge a list of names of lawmakers who have already been implicated. So a large number of members of Congress and businessmen, too, are very worried about this. The main business association, CONFIEP, was supporting Fujimori Group in Congress right up to the moment that they swore in the vice president last night a move which had no legal basis, of course, because the Congress had already been dissolved. So all this has to do with an attempt to prevent all the names involved in corruption from coming out. But the Constitutional Court has still not ruled on this power struggle between the President and Congress. So we'll have to wait and see what it says as well. We thank Veronica for that update. The Mexican government is proposing a big increase in welfare spending in next year's budget. President Andrés Manuel López Obrador wants to target the poorest sections of society, including pensioners, indigenous communities, and small farmers. The Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, says Mexico's current social policies are set to reduce the poverty and inequality left by previous administrations. Mexico has changed profoundly. It is changing its development model. It is replacing the neoliberal model, which in my opinion has no future, with one that distributes welfare horizontally, based on rights. At a regional conference on social development, the Minister of Welfare outlined the programs adopted by President Andrés Manuel López Obrador to combat the poverty that affects 52.4 million Mexicans. There is deep inequality between the poorest people and the rich. In three out of four municipalities, more than half the population live in poverty, and these poor areas are mostly in the south and southeast. The budget proposal which the government sent to Congress for 2020 includes almost $9 billion for the Ministry of Welfare. That is 15% more than in 2019. The aim is to change the lives of those who have least. Almost 17% of Mexicans cannot buy the basic food they need. And almost half cannot buy the basic food as well as the basic services and transport they need. One of the priorities is to increase the number of senior citizens who get the universal pension worth $130 a month. Another is to support the rural areas where poverty is most acute. However, money for all, this may be short, given the state of public finances left by previous governments. Andres Manuel has inherited a very big debt. Then there are the payments for pensions and to the various federal institutions and local governments. Out of what is left, almost two-thirds goes on social spending. The debate on the budget should conclude by the 15th of November, since the governing Morena party has a majority. That might swing it in favor of the president's plans. Riot police and for the first time the army in Colombia have used live ammunition to disperse a student protest in the city of Barranquilla. <laughs> Although the gathering was peaceful, the security forces also deployed tanks, trucks, patrol cars, and a bus to control the demonstration. A number of people were reportedly injured, with several students suffering gunshot wounds. Students of the University of the Atlantic were demonstrating in solidarity with university students in Bogota, who had been violently repressed by police forces last week.
Moving on, Ecuador has decided to withdraw from the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, on January the 1st of next year. According to the Ministry of Energy's official statement, the decision is based on internal issues and challenges that the country must face in relation to fiscal sustainability. Ecuador is one of the smallest producers in OPEC, although oil accounts for about half its foreign exchange earnings. It's thought the government may want to increase its output. Argentina's relationship with the International Monetary Fund has just got more complicated. The fund says it won't release any more money until after the elections. In spite of the Argentinian government's meetings with leaders of the IMF in the United States, led by President Mauricio Macri, the fund says it will not release the $5.4 million tranche scheduled for September. This has only added uncertainty to the current economic crisis. The presence of the International Monetary Fund and the policies it promotes hurts the most vulnerable sectors because they promote a concentration of wealth and we'll see that in the coming months as more jobs are lost, purchasing power drops and the government, backed by the IMF, pushes deflationary policies. Although President Macri's economic team have followed their instructions faithfully, the IMF representatives say no more money will arrive until after the presidential elections on the 27th of October. They want to see where Argentina's politics are heading. In terms of a renegotiation, they have been imposing conditions and putting more pressure on the government. But although Macri has been begging for these funds, the IMF has clearly decided that he won't win the elections, so they don't want to hand over the dollars. Analysts say that faced with a different government for the next four years, the IMF believes a renegotiation of Argentina's debt is possible and it is already preparing the terms of an extended facility which it will present to the incoming president. There is nothing new about the IMF imposing conditions that hurt the most vulnerable people. There isn't a good IMF and a bad IMF. They just do the same thing in a slightly more concealed way. The pension reform seeks to take money from pensioners, and that's quite deliberate on the part of this government. It wants to take away workers' social benefits. In exchange for renegotiating the debt, the International Monetary Fund will likely demand that the newly elected government carry out pension and labor reforms and an overall restructuring of public spending priorities. And that could lead to conflict with the candidate most likely to win the presidency because Alberto Fernandez has already said he won't accept such demands from the fund. Coming up, a Texas jury finds former Dallas police officer Amber Geiger guilty of the murder of both Ham John. More details coming up. Stay with us. A Texas jury has found former Dallas police officer Amber Geiger guilty of the murder of St. Lucia's national, Botham John. The murder occurred on September 6 of 2018 when Geiger wrongly walked into John's apartment, mistaking it for hers, and shot him dead. Botham John was a 26-year-old black accountant and was watching the television when Geiger walked into his apartment. She said she thought he was a burglar. Botham John's family, who were present at the trial, burst into tears as they heard the verdict. Geiger faces a prison sentence of 5 to 99 years. The defense team of John's family says this was a huge victory for black people in America. Uh, shortly going to hear from the family and, and they just want to thank this community. They want to thank the people of Dallas County. Uh, they want to thank this jury uh, for taking their time, hearing the evidence and getting it right. Uh, we still have the sentencing phase to go, but this is a huge victory, not only for the family of both of Jean, but as, as his mother Allison told me a moment ago, this is a, a victory for black people in America. Uh, it's, it's a signal that the the tide is going to change here. Police officers are going to begin to be held accountable for their actions, and we believe that that will begin to change policing culture all over the world. A Moroccan journalist has been sentenced to a year in prison for having premarital sex and an alleged illegal abortion. Ajar Rasuni and her, and her fiancé, Prof. Rifat Almin, 
were both arrested as they left a gynecologist clinic in the capital Rabat in August. Al Amin was sentenced to one year as an accomplice, while the gynecologist was slapped with a two-year jail term. The journalist criticized the entire ordeal, saying it was a political trial, as the police previously questioned her about her writing. Her lawyer said she was undergoing treatment for internal bleeding, but the prosecution insisted she had undergone a late voluntarily abortion. They can say that they were married, and we can prove it. So where do the allegations of sex outside marriage come from? Personally, I do not understand. So the difference of Haja and Rifat continues. We are sure of their innocence. I do not understand this judgment, which is a contradiction of jurisprudence. The president of Zimbabwe, Emerson Manengawa, has expressed satisfaction with the country's economic recovery. Given his State of the Nation address at the official opening of Parliament, the president said the country's economy was showing signs of growth despite the illegal sanctions imposed on the country. A group of demonstrators held banners outside Parliament denouncing the sanctions. The economic reforms we have embarked on are beginning to bear fruit. I am aware of the pain being experienced by the poor and the marginalized. Appropriate measures are being taken to address the cash situation, which include a gradual removal of arbitrage opportunities created through multi-tire pricing. Police have arrested more than 500 people in Indonesia's capital as the country wrestles with protests over divisive reforms. These included the banning of premarital sex and the weakening of the anti-graft agency. The protesters, many of whom were high school and university students, pelted riot police with stones in Jakarta as they clashed. The security forces geared up for more unrest on Tuesday as some 575 lawmakers were sworn in at the country's heavily barricaded parliament building. At least two students have died and hundreds more injured last week as a wave of unrest swept across Indonesia just weeks before President Joko Widodo begins another term. At least six people are feared dead in Taiwan after a bridge collapsed on a group of fishing boats that were moored on underneath. A rescue mission is underway after the 140-meter-long bridge came crashing down in Nanfagao, damaging two fishing boats and two vehicles. At least 12 people have been injured, including six Filipino and three Indonesian fishing workers. The cause of the incident is not yet known, but it happened while a patrol tanker was driving across the bridge. The police in Kenya have killed three men suspected of planning attacks in the coastal city of Mombasa. The three suspects were killed in a raid on a house in the south of the city. Seven other suspects were arrested at the same house. The police said they seized weapons, bulletproof vests and military uniforms from the suspect's hideout. North Korea state news agency says the country has agreed to hold working level talks with the United States on Saturday. This development could break months of stalemate since a failed summit in Vietnam in February. According to the news agency, the two countries agreed to have preliminary contact on Friday, followed by the working level talks. No further details were provided. On Tuesday, U.S. State Department spokeswoman Morgan Ortagus confirmed that U.S. and North Korean officials plan to meet within the next week but did not elaborate and with that story we've come to the end of this news brief you can find these and other stories and our website at telesorenglish.net and also join us on social media we are on facebook on twitter and on instagram for telesorenglish i am estefania bravo thank you for watching